Now, we will be getting back in a regular routine. We've got some things uh, uh, outstanding uh, uh, as far as parts of a series are concerned, and we'll get back to those next time. But uh, we did have a question, and that question was, how uh, do you know when you're tempted? And we tried to answer that by saying, uh, when aren't you tempted? Uh, even though you may not be tempted in a specific area at any one certain time, you still are tempted in other areas. For example, the old sin nature is a constant source of, of temptation. As to get uh, carnal, uh, it is opposed to um, spirituality and will always be. Uh, so that's the source of temptation, is how to stay spiritual and uh, should I get, uh, as they say, in the flesh. So um, uh, just because you're not tempted and you can relax and, and rest in one area, there are other areas that always crop up. So the answer to it is to be prepared. Now, we went down and looked at several points that are important to our understanding and discussion. First of all, there is a tempter. And he is called with the definite article, the tempter. Because it's a substantive, that's what he is and what he does. Present participle, he will always be that way and he will always do that. As long as he has run of, of certain areas, he is going to confront us. So it's important for us to understand that though we may not be tempted by the tempter himself, that he has a lot of hosts henchmen, cohorts, whatever you want to call them, that, um, that are assigned to us and that are there for that specific purpose. If you are unsaved, they tempt you to stay that way. Uh, if you are saved, they tempt you to be carnal. Uh, if you are saved and advancing, they tempt you to, to slack off, you know, uh, to, to stop your motivation and uh, to quit advancing in uh, spiritual things. Now, we actually saw that the word from which all sources of tempt, tempting, the tempter uh, is derived, uh, the Greek word, literally means to put to the test, to analyze, to do an experiment on, to see what it's made of. So when we understand that and then we look at the life of Job, as we saw, we can understand that that's what Satan is doing. He did it to Christ. He's going to do it to us. What are you made of spiritually? So he's going to put you to the test. The thing is, in order for God to win the angelic conflict, he has to allow that. If you never go through the test, if Christ would never have been put through a test, then Satan wins. Uh, it has to be a real test under certain conditions where there is pressure, there is stress uh, or that you have to own up to as to the knowledge. Uh, otherwise, he defeats you and, uh, and he wins. So this is a real important uh, thing to understand. Now, first of all, we saw then uh, in keeping with this that he tests uh, along two lines. One, along the line of testing as the devil. Now that means he is going to be able, like he tried to do with Job, to throw stones at his character, uh, to see if there were some uh, windows that he could break, some flaws, so that he could uh, uh, accuse. And that's what the devil means, to be the accuser. You see there, see how he failed, see the weakness. Uh, he, he doesn't own up, he doesn't deserve to sit on the throne. But then we also saw in the, um, uh, uh, the illustration of Christ that Lucifer not only tempted him as the devil, he always, uh, also tempted him as Satan. And Satan means an adversary that prevents you from advancing. One who stands eyeball to eyeball, toe to toe, face to face, and, and keeps you from heading that way to victory. And so in these two ways, Lucifer attacks us. But then we also saw that he attacks us along the lines of ignorance and cognizance. Given enough time, do we know what to do? Have we learned it? Uh, and then, uh, if not, we're defeated. But then he also uh, tests us along the lines that if we know what to do, will we do it? Will we act on it? 
Uh, and so it's important to, to see just how it is uh, that he, um, he takes us uh, down these tests. Now, that brings us then to 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse number 13. And it's important to understand that this particular verse of Scripture falls in the heart of <laughs> Paul's epi uh, epistle to the Corinthians, and these were the most carnal of them all. Not only were they tempted, they succumbed. Uh, uh, I was sinking deep in sin, dead saying, we, and then followed with that. There you go, bravo. Uh, because that's the way they were. They were saved, but they were the most carnal of all of the churches. So he begins to tell them something about the temptation. Uh, verse number 6. These things were our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Uh, and uh, uh, verse 11. These things happened to them for our examples. They're written for our admonition not to do it. So then he tells us about temptation. And I really bring us to this uh, verse to document it's something you should expect. Therefore, or there rather, hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. Anthropos is the Greek word, and it means belonging to man as a normal occurrence. Are unbelievers tempted? Sure they are. Prisons are full of them. Uh, you know, tempted to do something. Are, unbelie are unbelievers tempted to stay unsaved? Yes. Unbelievers tempted to do this, that, and the other? Absolutely. Where does the temptation come from? From the same sources of temptation that, that uh, uh, we have. The world, the flesh, and the devil. They still have the flesh. But they don't know how to combat it, you see. They still have the devil, uh, but uh, uh, he's the one who keeps them unsaved. The God of this world hath blinded their mind. That's a temptation. Uh, and uh, they still have the world around them, about them, the world view that they assume. And because they want the praise of men rather than God, it's a temptation not to take a stand for God. So that's why he says, there's no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. It's natural to be tempted. It's a common occurrence. And it's something that happens to each and every one of us. Now, eventually, more or less, all of us are going to, to, to face uh, uh, various types of temptation simply because in our old sin nature there is a spectrum. There's, there's a moral spectrum, immoral spectrum, religious, irreligious. There is an area of strength, an area of weakness. And there are always those trends or tendencies. And uh, Lucifer hits those particular things. But note what it says here about temptation. God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted above that you're able now here's where school comes in. Would it be fair for an eighth grade teacher to come down to the first grade student and give that student a test on eighth grade material when all this time the first grade student has been covering first grade material? Would that be something just and fair? Uh, would that, that person naturally fail it? Well, of course. They're not mature enough. They've not covered the material. You have to go up the ranks in order to, to take step one, two, three, the ABCs, as it were. So what God has done has said, I'm not going to allow a po more powerful demon, a more powerful fallen angel to test you in a, uh, in a particular area. You're going to be tested along the lines of your grade level, your own maturity. So you can, you can uh, uh, pretty well bank on the fact that when you are tested, uh, it's not some bigger, more powerful angel. It's one in who, on whose level you um, uh, are at. And that's not good English, is it? Uh, one on whose level you are. There we go. You see, I, I learned something in those classes, uh, too. 
So, what does that mean? Well, it also means that you have to face the fact that um, if you're still on the ABCs, if you're still on the ground level, you know, if you're still in, in kindergarten, that's where you are. Uh, and that's where you're going to be tested. And if you don't advance, if you don't beat this guy, you're never going to get to first grade. And if you don't get to first grade soon, you're never going to get to second. And eventually you're never going to graduate from this and, and arrive at full spiritual maturity. Now, in every area, there are levels of maturity that you attain. But God wants you to attain maximum spiritual maturity. That's the goal. So this is what he says. God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted above that you're able. With your knowledge, your capacity, uh, you're going to be tempted commensurate with a demon or fallen angel uh, in that level. But one more thing we need to see. What we're doing tonight is for you and for me a fulfillment of the last part of this verse. But will with the temptation make a way to escape that you might be able to bear it? Well, you say, see, I don't have to go through this. I don't have to face this. Uh, I, can, I can have the fire. No, that's not what it means. It means that the way of escape is, is defeating. Not that if you do not face the test, you do not get promoted. If you do not pass the test, you don't advance. That's not what it's talking about here. You must pass the test and take the test. Because if you don't, you will never go up the ladder. What it's talking about is that, is that when the tests come... God's system can help you be victorious in the test. You can give the right answers. You can actually spout off what you're supposed to do and do it. Now, we take you back to the example of the Lord Jesus Christ. Did God test him or not? Yes. He allowed Jesus Christ to be tested of the devil and of Satan. Were these real tests? Absolutely. Well, did God make a way of escape in providing, like when he was hungry, food off to the side so that he could get that food so he wouldn't turn the, uh, the rocks and the stones to bread? No, he did not. How did Jesus Christ bear up under it? He quoted the word of God to the issue. That's what he did. And then he acted on what he knew. That is what it's talking about. But he could only do that because... Uh, he had dedicated his life to learning the Word. Let's look at the Lord Jesus Christ a moment. Going back to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. And verse number 49. Now, he was 12 years of age at this point. He was taken to uh, the temple at Passover at uh, 12 years of age. And he knew so much doctrine that he confounded and astounded those men who had the certificates and, uh, and the sheepskins and the like in the law and in the word. He knew more than they did at age 12. Now, again, that lets us know something about the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. It says in Hebrews, I've come to do thy will, O God. He could not be uh, 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 confounded with ignorance. He had to know what to do. And that's why his whole life was, was dedicated to learning doctrine. Verse number 49. He said unto them, How is it that you sought me? Know ye, know ye not that I must be about my father's business? Now, what was his father's business? To do his will. To accomplish his will. To accomplish it how? By keeping himself perfect. That means in every instance of his life, he had to know how to, um, to uh, forego 
uh, succumbing to temptation. Now, how did that happen? Verse number 52. And Jesus increased in wisdom. That is the word for Bible doctrine. Jesus increased in Bible doctrine and stature, spiritually and physically, and in favor with God and man. So, Jesus Christ can be our example. He learned the scripture. He sacrificed many of the other things that young people did, that adults would do, so that he could arrive at a certain place uh, uh, to glorify God the Father. All right, now let's go back to James and look at a couple other things here. James chapter 1, verse We're going to be moving in toward um, uh, something here that is another area that we need to perceive. And actually, it's, it's going to seem like an area where we're asking for trouble. It's not, but it's going to seem that way. The first thing we need to see then is in verse number 13. Let no man say when he is tempted... I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempts he any man. Second Peter chapter 2. Just, a, just a, two books over. God does not tempt to sin. He does not tempt to evil. But he allows it to happen because... Temptation is nothing more than a trial or a test. And in order for him to win, he must allow it to happen. All right? Verse number 9. Here's what God does. And this is that provide a way of escape that you might be able to bear it. The Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation. Jesus Christ was delivered from the temptation by understanding what he should do and then go ahead and do it to reserve the unjust to the day of judgment. But now this seems quite odd because the scripture says God does not tempt. But let's go back to Genesis 22. Genesis chapter 22. And we'll start reading with verse number one. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham. Now you have to ask yourself the question, wait a minute here. God does tempt and God doesn't tempt. The, the answer is simply this. God does not tempt as far as evil is concerned. He will never put something in front of you uh, so, that, uh, so that you have to, to choose between him and, uh, and sin. Uh, he wants to deliver you out of temptation. He wants to give you the know-how, the techniques, the wherewithal, the strength to, to bear up and under it and be victorious. That's his business. Grace provides only for spiritual success, not for failure. But now we find... God is tempting Abraham. He does tempt with respect to obedience. After all, that's why he put Job or allowed what uh, uh, Job to go through what he did. In actuality, and this is what we're going to cover here, God called for the question. Now, what does that mean? It means that it was Job's turn. Lucifer came up. And it was God himself who said, Have you considered my servant Job? <laughs> it was God who reminded Lucifer of Job down there on earth. 
Is God himself, you know, thanks, Lord, for the favor. <laughs> Here he was, rich and comfortable and all, had all these things going for him. And all of a sudden, God gets the great idea to remind this guy, Lucifer, I've got someone down on earth here that you seem to keep passing by. Have you considered him? And he did it, not only did it one time, he did it the second time. Comes back and puts him through all of that. Job, Job came through with flying colors and he said, well, now look, he still maintains his integrity. He didn't do what you said he'd do under those circumstances. And he reminded him again. But he called for the question. And so, this is, this is part of the temptation where God calls for the question and your name and your number comes up and so, so does mine. Uh, good news and bad news. God remembers us, sure, to put us through the test. That's what he is doing here. Abraham's called the friend of God. All right, now, how is he going to demonstrate it? And that's in actuality what temptation is. It's a demonstration one way or another of the creature's obedience or disobedience to God. That the substance and suitability will either be there or not. So let's look. God did tempt Abraham. Abraham said, here am I. Take now your son, your only son Isaac, to Moriah, an offering there as a burnt offering at one of the mountains. So, you know the story, we'll not go through it. But you come down to verse number 22. Let's see. It's not verse number 22. It's verse number 12. That's what I wanted, 12. Abraham was just about to kill him. Kill Isaac, sacrifice him. And God said, or the angel, which was representative of, of the Lord, the angel of the Lord, Lay not your hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. Now note these words. This is why God allows the temptation or the trial. For now I know that you fear God, seeing that you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Now, in the course of the angelic conflict, there are two things that, that are prevalent. God's omniscience, and we might call that theory. God said a whole a lot of things about uh, Jesus Christ as what he can do. God said a whole lot of things about Job as to what he was and what he could do. God has said a whole lot of things about Abraham, but it's all theory until what? You're tested under actual conditions. Will Abraham prove himself faithful and obedient to God? It goes from theory to actuality. And so when put under those conditions, Abraham was obedient to God and was about to kill Isaac. And God said, hold on, <laughs> that's, that's enough. I'm, I don't want you to kill your son. But note what he said. Now I know. I demonstrated it both to myself and others. It's not that God's omniscience didn't know it, but in time it had to be seen. I've seen it. Now, this is called the doctrine of proving. Let's go to Luke 14. Luke 14. Now the doctrine of proving means that you take something from the realm of theory or what's said about a certain person or thing and test it in actuality, under certain conditions, to see the substance. That's what a temptation is all about. Now we're going to uh, use um, this as an illustration. Luke 14, verse 19. This guy was invited to a wedding, and he wanted to beg off. And he said, and an, uh, I have bought five yoke of oxen. And I go to prove them. Now, we would call that today a test drive. You know, here, here's the car. 
it's beautiful it, it it's brand new it smells of brand new or it's it's used and but uh, it's real clean and low miles and this sort of thing and the salesman gives it his pitch uh and uh, uh this is the car you need but it's all theory so what do you have to do in order to make sure that it is what he says it is you have to prove it so therefore, you get in the car, it starts. That's, that's the step one. Good, the thing starts. Put it in gear, and you drive it. And that's what this guy was doing with the yoke of oxen. He bought a, a five a yoke, uh, the ten, uh, ten of these oxen. And, um, and uh, this salesman said, these oxen will plow so many fields, they'll do this, that, and the other, and pull this type of cart and this type of load. And so the guy said, I, I purchased them. He should have tested them first, but I purchased them. Now I go to prove them, to demonstrate if they will do what the salesman said they'd do. Now, in the angelic conflict, God must do the very same thing. He must allow that to happen. God said, Christ will never sin. Christ will never fail. Christ will always be successful. But that's theory. Unless he's put to the test, which he was, uh, uh, it, it's all a matter of, of academics. Well, that's what you say, but uh, uh, let's see what he's made of. And God does the very same thing with you and with me. He says, we're on this level of maturity. This is how he's going to act. And Satan says, I don't believe it. Just like with Job. I don't believe it. You're doing this and the other. You remove your hand and allow me to work on him directly. And he'll curse you to the face. And so God says, all right, hands off. You have at it. And so that's what the temptation is all about. A visible physical demonstration evidence that what God has said about us is true or or not we can't fail but um, that's what this is all about so let's go back to the book of Job Job chapter 31 Now, in the second case, not only can God call for the question, but we can call for the question. After all, if we go on and on and on and things seem to be good and nothing seems to be happening, we begin to question. We should begin to question our spirit. After all, if we're not being tested <laughs> in certain areas, uh, perhaps it's because we're carnal and, and the Satan doesn't have to work on us as hard. And so therefore there comes a time and we'll show you men in the scriptures and in the, the apostle Paul who called for the question. Now, what's the question? Are you at a certain level? What's the answer? The answer is in the temptation and victory in this trial or testing. Job 31. Verse number four. Does not God see my ways and count all my steps? Yes, of course he does. But that's God. What about everybody else? If I have walked with vanity and if my foot has hasted to deceit, let me be weighed in an even balance. I'm calling for the question. I don't believe I've sinned, says Job. The fact of the matter was, when God and Lucifer got this big idea to put him to the test, Job had not sinned. Job walked before God perfectly and he eschewed evil. He was a fantastic spiritual believer and he was ad ad advancing and he had all of these material blessings and the like. He was the greatest man on earth at the time, the scripture says of him. But now he's reduced to nothing on one side and then his health is reduced to the point of death on the other side. And it all happened within a short period of time. I mean, just a couple hours and poof, he's, he's gone, you see. The only thing remaining is his life within him and his integrity. And in all these things, Job sinned not with his lips nor charged God foolishly. Now, what, we're going to read some more here. But what happened to Job at the end of it? Remember how we tabulated his age? It's because God gave him at the end of the book twofold more than he had. 
If he had never been put through the test, he would have never advanced twofold more. He would have never gotten more than, uh, than what he had at the time. To get more, you have to take the test. Once you take the test and pass, then you advance. All right, so, so that's what he did. He called for the question. I want to be weighed in an even balance here. That God may know my integrity. And it's not just for God, though, as we've seen. It's so that the angels, both fallen and faithful, can see his integrity. And men can see it. Uh, the integrity of Abraham. He was, he was going to do it. And God said, wait, uh, that's enough. You're, you're my friend. And he was called among men the friend of God because he was so faithful. All right, let's go to Exodus. Exodus chapter 16. Now, I heard somebody call my, my name, or what was that, just a noise? <laughs> or I'm, I'm hearing things? Now, we're going to go through some scriptures here because it's, it's important to see that this is a, a common approach for God. It is uh, something in common for men. Will they get saved or won't they? Are they going to be obedient to the gospel or disobedient? Will they trust in Christ or will they reject him? And all of these are part of the evidence in the angelic conflict. It's not just what God says about them. It's what they actually do in time and in life and in their soul that counts. So Exodus 16 verse number 4. And this is the, there are so many uh, along these very same lines. I'll just pick out a few. Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you. This is the manna. The people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day. And note, why did he do this? That I might prove them whether they will walk in my law or no. That was a test. It was a, a physical, visible demonstration of whether they would or would not do what God says. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 8. Deuteronomy chapter 8. Verse 1. All the commandments which I command thee this day, ye shall observe and do, and you'll live and possess the land. And you will remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these 40 years to humble you and to prove you. To know what is in your heart, whether you will keep his commandments or no. So he humbled thee uh, and suffered you to, to hunger, fed you with manna, um, which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers, that he might make thee know that man does not live by bread only, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Jesus Christ went through a test that the first generation of Exodus Jews went through. Hunger. And where they failed, he succeeded. He knew the word of God and he lived by it. He demonstrated what they did. They were disobedient in the gathering of the manna. Remember, they were supposed to gather a certain portion and not keep it overnight. And some of them did it and kept it overnight. They were not to go out on the seventh day. And some did it. And they disobeyed God even though he told them exactly what to do. He knew them by what they did. And they failed the test. All right, Psalm 17. Now we're getting into some interesting areas here. Psalm 17. And verse number one. Here is Psalm of David, a prayer. And it's interesting that in, in many of these prayers, what he asks God to do is in the imperative mood. 
He is commanding God to do something on his behalf. And what he was commanding was, put me to the test. He was saying, God, I'm calling for the question. Uh, you called for it in the case of Job. I'm calling it for my own case because I want to advance. Hear the right, O Lord. Attend to my cry. Give ear to my prayer. It doesn't go out with feigned lips. Let my sentence come forth from thy presence. Now the sentence there is the testing that would demonstrate his faithfulness. I'll tell you what, this guy had guts. <laughs> okay, Lord, put me to the test. That meant big time problems. But he knew unless he went through the test, he could not advance. So he asked for his sentence, his name, his number, his time to come up. Let my sentence come forth from your presence. Let thine eyes behold the things that are equal. In other words, don't let it be unfair. The Lord is faithful and will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able. That's what that means. Uh, make it equal so that that demon and that fallen angel will test me uh, commensurate with my capabilities. Thou hast proved mine heart. And that's what these things are all about. You have visited me. You have tried me. And you'll find nothing. In other words, you put me through there and I demonstrated that I was right with you no matter what I went through. I stayed faithful to your word in my life. Um, I am a purpose that my mouth shall not transgress. Concerning the works of men, by the word of thy lips, I have kept me from the paths of the destroyer. The devil and Satan, the one who wants to destroy his uh, character and destroy his testimony and prevent him from advancing. But David wanted to advance and he called for the question, Lord, put me through it. I want to move ahead. All right. Psalms 26. And starting with verse 1. Now, all of these things are ask, uh, asking for God to allow him to be tempted, to be put in these circumstances which would refine him, which would show him uh, that he was what, uh, what he said. So, verse 1, David again, Judge me, O Lord, for I have walked in mine integrity. I have trusted also the Lord, therefore I shall not slide. I'm not a backslider. I'm not carnal. I remain faithful. I'm walking in the Lord's paths under the Lord's light. Examine me, O Lord. Now, this literally means to, to take apart his life bit by bit uh, in any, to, to show any area that might be corrupted or perverted or, or, or immature so that uh, it might be made known to him that he can fix it. That's the whole idea. Examine me, O Lord. Prove me. Try my reins and my heart. Now, what are the reins? Reins are the steering wheel of the soul. You can go right, you can go left, or you can go straight ahead. And so that's what he's saying. Put me in a situation where I have to choose the options, and I'll show you that I will keep on the straight and narrow path to your glory. But it only comes by way of the, que of the, of the uh, test, and that comes by way of calling for the question. Now, might I say, as I'm teaching this, don't do it unless you're ready. Don't call for the question unless you're prepared to be put through the test. All right, let's go on. 139 in this same book. 139. Now, in a couple of these areas, he's going to say that God already did this. This is something that is on a regular schedule. It's going to be routine. You've got to take the test. You've got to get back and, and learn it. Then the test always comes. So he says, Lord, you have searched me and known me. That's what it's all about. 
It's not that God's omniscience doesn't know. It's that uh, his omniscience must be demonstrated in actuality. You know my down-sitting, my uprising. You understand my thoughts uh, afar off. You compass my path and my lying down. You're acquainted with all my ways. But that comes by calling the question. Uh, verse 23 and 24. Search me, O God. Know my heart, try me, and know my thoughts. Now, that just simply means, am I in fellowship? Am I not? Am I saved? Am I not? Do I know? Am I putting in the time to learn it? Or I'm not? He's calling for the question, and it takes uh, uh, something personal from God. It's God who is going to, uh, to do all of these things to, to David uh, so that um, uh, he will come forth tried as gold, tried as silver, purified and more valuable having gone through the trial. See if there be any wicked way in me, and once you know that there's not, then lead me in the way everlasting. All right, let's go back then to James chapter 1. James chapter 1. Now we're going to take some kingdom verses, but they pertain to us today. James chapter 1, verse number 2. Now, when won't we be tempted? There's never going to be a time because there's a spectrum of, of uh, temptations that are out there we all must face. We've got to learn how to deal with them and we have to take the test. Sometimes God is going to call for the question. Sometimes we should call for the question. Verse 2 of James 1. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. <laughs> <laughs> Why, though? No. When it's difficult and, uh, and you want to take things in your own hands, you want to handle it your own way, uh, you want to do things contrary to the will of God, thinking that somehow that's going to bring you out on top. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith works patience. Tribulation works patience. That's what Paul says. Call for the question. Tribulation's coming because tribulation is part of the test. Oh, boy. Why do I have to teach this? We should teach something easy here. Because we all have to call for the question sometime or another. That means me too. Let patience have a perfect work. Why? That ye may be perfect. Remember what Jesus said the standard is? Be therefore perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Well, how do you get that way? Learning and living, learning it, being put through the test and applying what you know. And so that's what it says. Let patience that comes by this tribulation have her perfect work, the work of perfection in your life, that you might be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. You have touched every base, every rung of the ladder, every level of, of, of the academic truth that you know, and you've applied it to life, and now you are advancing toward that goal of, of spiritual maturity. Let's go to 1 Peter. Our last verse will allow for questions if there are any. And sometime down the road here, we'll take you to the Apostle Paul and, and show you some of the various categories of testing. There's thought testing, motivation testing, attitude testing. There's people testing. Have you been tested by people this past week? Certainly, they, certainly you have. Uh, there is uh, system testing. This is the devil's world, and most of the systems there are unfair, especially to believers, because the world hates believers. And you have to face these injustices with, um, uh, with, it, with a certain attitude so that you might be victorious. Um, there's prosperity testing, and, and we're going to deal with that uh, because of a question of, of what I keep saying about God blessing America, and I want to explain that. 
because I certainly want, hey, I live in America. I like the freedom here. Uh, I want God to bless. But how does he bless? Why does he bless? And, and what should be our, our viewpoint on that? And uh, believe it or not, it all has to do with temptation. You see, we're now several weeks away from the Trade Center bombing. And that first weekend, everything was shut down and the churches were packed full. We're two weeks away. The ball games have opened up on Sunday. Uh, and uh, where were the people? Just where were the American people? All of a sudden, God's not so important anymore. Uh, they're not going to take away our prosperity. We're going to make it. We're going to rebuild and all this. We're going to get back at them. And so uh, we don't need God so much anymore. But the goodness of God in America should lead one to what? Repentance. And it's not just repentance of faith in Christ, but a whole change of attitude that you might be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you might do what? Prove the good and perfect and acceptable will of God. Isn't prove our word the doctrine of proving it? You know what the word of God is and you can demonstrate it in your life so that you prove it to others. 